Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. In conjunction with the GCLS virtual series, I want to welcome you to the March GCLS Writing Academy After Dark virtual event, The Thrill of the Thriller. This panel is sponsored by Inkstacks. Inkstacks is a company dedicated to helping writers by integrating technologies designed to navigate the writing process. To do this, we use a thing called the guided path, which is a roadmap that takes writers from their moment of inspiration through the realization of their writing goals. What is the Inkstacks guided, guided path? We don't claim to know the one true path because we don't think one true path exists. Instead, we believe there are many paths and that's what makes the process a little overwhelming and hard to navigate when a writer is first starting out or just having trouble getting back on the path when they've wandered off. The Inkstax Guided Path provides each user with an online writing center, planning worksheets, project calendar, project tracker, education center, writing workshops, and inspirational messages. Every writer is different, and our goal is to be your guide when you need to find your path. Let Inkstax help you lead the way. Check us out at inkstax.com. Thanks again to Inkstax for sponsoring this panel. Please remember the GCLS Code of Conduct, which you can read more about in the chat and on the GCLS website. We really hope that you enjoy this event. And now I'd like to turn the session over to our moderator, Rita Potter. Hello, everybody. Welcome um, to the thrill of the thriller. Um, hope to have a really good time here today. And um, like Finn said, please put the questions and answers in the Q&A, not the chat, because I'm not talented enough to be watching the Q&A and asking questions and listening to people all at the same time. So um, with that, I want to jump right in here. Um, we got a lot of questions and probably a lot of questions from you, too. So first, I'd like to introduce our panelists. And first, we have Tammy Bird. Tammy is the author of two thriller suspense novels and multiple short stories and stories in Flash. She lives with her wife, their corgi, and two cats in a little city in North Carolina where she works as an educator and an author. When she's not writing strong women-identified characters, she's an avid reader of books with the same. She often indulges her ice cream and garden gnome addictions and watches way too many crime shows. Then we have Sue Green. Susan Green has been a journalist for more than 30 years, working as a producer, executive producer, and managing editor at the TV stations in Phoenix, Los Angeles, Washington, DC, and New York City. She decided to leave the fast paced life of a journalist for the mountains of North Carolina, where she lives with her wife, Robin, and their dog, Kai. When she's not watching sports or scary movies, she's usually on the computer writing. Then we have Cheryl Head. A Detroit Navy native, Cheryl Head writes the Charlie Mack Motown mystery series, which features a black bisexual cis female private investigator. Books in the series have been finalists for the Lambda Literary Award, the Next Generation Indie Book Award, and the Goldie. Book four, Judge Me When I'm Wrong, was named the 2020 Ann Van and Popular Choice. Cheryl lives in Washington, DC with her supportive posse, Abby, Frisbee, and Teresa. The first two are dogs. <laughs> Last, we have Stacy Lynn Miller. She's a retired Air Force officer turned author of sapphic romantic crime thrillers and mysteries with Bella Books and Sovereign River Publishing. 20 years toting a gun and police badge, tinkering with computers and sleuthing for clues as an investigator formed the basis of her popular Manhattan Sloan thriller series. She's a visually impaired stroke survivor, mother of two, tech nerd, chocolate lover, terrible golfer, and a GCLS Writing Academy graduate. She has four releases with 11 more on the way. So those are your panelists. Um, Obviously we got some diversity here and I'm just gonna start in asking some questions. I'll, I'll start with you, Cheryl. Um, who was your um, writing influence? Uh, for lesbic, I think it would be Nikki Baker. Uh, she was the first African-American mystery writer that I came across. And I think that she is the first one. Uh, she did a, um, an amateur detective. Her first book, I think was Lavender House Murders. I saw it when I was in Provincetown and ran to the rack and snatched it up and ran to the, to the uh, cash register. <laughs> Should I ask when that was? Who? <laughs> or maybe you I shouldn't have. I don't, I don't remember, uh, but it was, uh, I was in Provincetown for Women's Week. And it was back when there were really a lot of women and not a lot of straight people, like it is now. 
What about you, Stacy? Who's your um, writing influence? I actually wasn't much, much of a re reader until 2015 when I started having a series of strokes. Um, but when I was in the uh, Air, Air, Air Force and uh, did a lot of cross country moves, um, I listened to uh, audiobooks and I got into uh, the uh, uh, Jack, Jack, Jack Ryan series um, by uh, Tom, Tom, Tom Clancy and uh, John, John Grisham's legal, legal, legal thrill thrillers. Love those. Okay. What about you, Sue? Who's your influence? Um, yeah, you know, I, I think that that for me, like like a lot of people, I mean, I, I was drawn to, you know, the James Patterson books, the Patricia Cornwell books, you know, David Baldutch, all those ones that are um, sort of these big crime type of things. But also I found myself reading like Ali uh, Bali as well. I, I just really love sort of the, the pacing that she had um, in her books. And, um, you know, for me, it was just about reading, reading, reading and watching, 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 you know, whether it was television, movies, et cetera, um, you know, so it wasn't just one little area. It was a very broad area uh, of people that influenced me, I think. Okay, and Tammy, what about you? Um, well, much like Sue, I grew up on Patterson and, and Cornwall and things like that. And uh, I also dating myself the first uh, the first book I ever picked up that was lesbian based was Rita Mae Brown. So that uh, that tells you how long ago I I read that. And, and I thought when I read that, oh, man, if I could combine, you know, the the world of of Rita Mae Brown with the world of Patterson, what would that look like? And I think that's kind of what started me um, thinking in that direction. Okay. Um, as we all know, romance in, in, in any, any place, not just lesbic, but anywhere is the biggest seller. So Cheryl, why did you decide to go with, with this genre instead of staying strictly with romance? I don't write romance well. Um, I, <laughs> I love mysteries and I I find it easier to write mysteries because I love it and I'm a, a fan and a, a kind of a minor student of mystery and crime fiction. I don't read a lot of romance. I'll read one if a friend asked me to read it. Um, and, and when I had to convert the first Charlie book uh, from, uh, I originally self-published it and By Word of Books came to me and asked if I would change the character and make her a lesbian. All my beta readers said they already thought she was a lesbian, but I didn't have any sex or romance scenes in it. And so I had to add them and it was grueling work and nobody helped me. It was hard, but there was a, there was a lot of sex in book one and very little sex in book six. So I don't know what that says about me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what about you, Stacy? Why did you choose this genre? Well, I write what what excites me. Uh, I have a background in uh, law 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 enforcement, and uh, I've always been drawn to action move move movies and and police shows. So I like a, a story of good versus evil, where more than 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 a bro broken heart is 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 at stake. Great. Um, okay. The question everybody needs to know, and especially for this genre, because you need to know who the bad guy is. Um, are you plotters or pantsers? Let's start with you, Sue. <laughs> um, I started uh, writing and I was a pantser and I enjoyed it. It's, I think that's part of my journalism training. You get all this information and then you just start going at it and then you start taking stuff out. Um, but what I quickly figured out was that I needed to be a little bit more of a plotter because when you're dealing with crime thriller, you know, type of, of books, you have to, you're dropping little hints throughout. Everything is like, you know, something's going to happen four chapters away, but I need to make sure I take care of beginning to open that door, you know, much earlier. So um, it took me a, a little while to, to figure out um, how to do that and and to be comfortable with it um, because I, I just am not a planner. I just don't sit there in, in my regular life um, and, you know, sort of process uh, that way. So, so it has been different um, for me to do that. But what I still find is that um, 
as I would break down and start figuring out chapter by chapter, um, I still did it old school and wrote it all out. You know, it's like, you know, I know there are all these things you can do online to keep things organized and whatever. Um, but I still was old school. If I wrote it, I could figure it out. And then once I got in the computer, it was, uh, it could sort of flow and feel like it was a pantser and that I hadn't plotted it out as much as I did. I don't know if that makes yourself. sense. Good, good, good plan. <laughs> <laughs> Tammy, what about you? Uh, well, I started out very much as a pantser too, and I still enjoy that very much. In the very beginning, I love that big dump and just writing whatever comes to mind. But I discovered too that there were times when I needed to be more of a plotter, and so I've tried to train myself toward that. Mine's for a little bit different reason though, um, uh, like Cheryl, I don't write romance well, but in Lesvik, they want some romance happening, even in the, even in thrillers where I have the serial killer doing these things. Um, they still want at least some little bit of that. And so I have to plan that I have to sit down and say, okay, where in this wild, wicked ride that I want to take these people on, can I fit um, kind of this sub uh, story of this romance between between these characters. And so that's I I discovered that if I planned a little bit more in general, that I could work that in much better. So I I I guess I'm a little bit of both. I still have moments where I just um pant away and just go for it, but I also usually have some plan. What about you, Stacy? I'm 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 with Tam Tammy. Um well, I have a uh, mil, 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 military background, so it's very structured. Um, I need lists every, every, everywhere I go. So, so my outline is my 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 road 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 roadmap. I take lots of d d d detours along 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 the way, but uh, I I always end 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 up at 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 my plan des, des destination so you do it well so <laughs> you get there <laughs> cheryl what about you well i am a hybrid now i started off for sure as a plotter um the first book the outline wasn't necessarily on paper but i had it in my head um and then the second book was a massive outline with intricate plot points and stuff like that and for book three, I realized since I already I usually have the concept already, I tried, I thought, well, it might be fun just to write until I can't think of what happens next. And so I tried that and it was I enjoyed doing it. And uh, so you I think it gives you a little more creativity when you can pants. And then when you get the block, you think, okay, then what happens next? Let me go and plot that out. So that's what I'm doing now. And I, I enjoy it that way. I think um I tend to get caught up in the plot and I think I'm, I think the essence then of my writing and the kind of the emotional heft of the writing goes away then. So this hybrid approach has been very good for me. Okay. Um, this question's for Tammy and Sue. Um, after reading your work, you guys get pretty deep into some psychological places that I don't know if everybody wants to go. How, <laughs> how do you go about doing that? Um, getting in the mind of the, the bad guy, so to speak. Sue, why don't you go first? <laughs> Um, yeah, mine's a little sick. I, you know, I, I am a little out there on the edge, um, but I love it. I was reading it to my, my aunt who is, uh, in her late seventies and about halfway through the opening scene, she told me to stop. So I don't know if that was good or bad, but it was very real. Um, I think that, that one of the, the reasons is that again, as I mentioned, you know, we're all sort of falling back on our prior careers, maybe in life. Um, as a journalist, it's all about getting answers. You know, we're always about why did this person do that? You know, who's behind it? What details are there? What's going to drive it? And so I think that that really um, became important for me to, to get the answers. So in plotting everything out, um, as an example, we had uh, one of my anchors one day got an envelope in the mail at the station and, and we opened it up and there were two bullets in it. And nothing else, just the bullets. And um, we had, she, you know, we were like, okay, she's got someone that's, you know, that's stalking her. And uh, we had to call the police. And then the police came and 
they set up a whole sting thing and we managed to get the guy or whatever, but it was, it was fascinating, you know, sort of being right there in the middle of it. Um, and I, you know, I, I look back at that as probably like the time when I was like, okay, people are a little twisted and I like it. So <laughs> how can I start to work a little bit with that? So yeah, that's probably my, my driving force. And you seem so nice. <laughs> Normal. I, I really am. I really, really am. <laughs> Amy, what about you? Well, and it, when uh, when my wife read Sandman after I'd written it, she said, oh, my God, I can't believe I've been sleeping with you for 20 years. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, and I, I think for me, it started very young for me. I was something that not a lot of people know. My dad um, was a recovering alcoholic and he was a sponsor to many, many people over the years. And he had invited someone into our home who he was sponsoring, who was staying. We always had these other people in our spare rooms. And um, it was it was wonderful to get to know all these different people. But this particular woman um, he had invited in, she was in, she, he, she was sleeping in, in the other room. And I came home from an overnight trip uh, when I was very young, um, 11 or 12, I think. And uh, my dad, and it was just my dad and I. And so I came home and he wasn't home and he was never not home when I got home. And um, about the time I got there trying to figure out what was going on, the police knocked on my door and the woman who had been living in our room, it turns out, had gone and killed my dad's fiance in her garden oh, that, um, that day. And um, he was at the, um, he was at the, uh, at the um, uh, police precinct. And so they wanted, they, they were taking me back where I had just come from to stay with them, et cetera. Well, it turned out through the trial that she had killed other people as well. And so I, at the time, I just remember thinking, what is in a person's mind that would make them do this? And it, it just kind of became an obsession for me to start researching and reading about uh, serial killers and and I I obsessed and I read and I studied I studied it in school I did um, and and it just has always fascinated me and so when I started to write that was just seemed the only way that my pen would go and so that's that's kind of where I ended up yeah those were two very interesting stories thank you um, settings of the book can sometimes take on a character there be a character of their own and and, and cheryl your your detroit series uh, with with charlie mack i mean i i when i read it detroit was a character in that book was that on purpose is, is that something that you really why how did that come about i guess is my question yeah no that, that you're absolutely right detroit is a, a an important character in the book and in the in the first one i'll, I'll, I'll just say this i have two conceits one, that black women are natural born detectives because we just do that all the time do, in our sleep. And two, that Detroit is this fascinating bellwether city in America that I think at least, you know, and maybe not so much now, but in the 50s and 60s and 70s, it's really kind of led around social and cultural um, invention. Um, and so I wanted to show Detroit um, as it had been when I was growing up there, the, its energy and its landmark and the intricacies of its people and its ethnicity and its diversity and the food. And I it certainly make Detroit a, 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 an important character. It depends on the book. And, and Tammy, I'll ask you the same question because I thought the, the, the Sandman story also, your, your setting had a big role in your book. Um, was that obviously yeah. on purpose? Yeah, well, it, it actually, uh, when I got the idea for Sandman, my wife and I were on vacation in uh, Buxton, North Carolina, which is the OBX, the Outer Banks. And it was October. And so it was really, it was late October and it was dead. There were, there was, there were no people. The stores were empty. Almost everything was closed. There was a little ice cream shop that was open. And we went into the ice cream shop to have an ice cream. And we were talking to the person that ran it. And we just kind of in conversation um, said, man, it is really, really quiet around here. And he said, yeah, it's so quiet that someone could bury a body in the dunes and no one would ever know. And I was like, whoa. And so just thinking about the beach and how 
it would play, what the part that the beach itself would play in that kind of scenario with the with the ocean and the the sand and people walking on top, you know, what what that would would mean weather wise. And that's kind of how that's kind of how Sandman was born, was from the place itself being characterized. Great. Um Interesting. Isn't it great how um, we take stories from, from different places? And that kind of ties into one of the questions in the q and I'm going to stop my pre-planned questions for a little bit because we're building up some questions in the Q&A. And one of the questions was, do you pull things out of the headlines? Um, I'm paraphrasing here, but do you pull things out of the headlines? Do you use real things? And Tammy, you kind of already said you kind of did. Um, <laughs> anybody else that, that do you pull real things out of, out of the headlines? Stacy? No, no. I, I do. Yeah, I do. Um, the Fix book was really a response to the the plot to kidnap and kill the governor of Michigan. I'm th thinking, who the hell are these people, and what are they about, and where did they come from? You know. So yeah, I uh, you know sometimes my partner gets the hard copy of two papers, and there was one paper a couple Sundays ago where I. Every every story on that page I could have written about a book about. <laughs> it was amazing stuff that's happening in real life. Art really does imitate life. <laughs> and Sue, what about you? Um, absolutely. I mean, I you know I read, I watch, I you know I'm constantly getting information in. Um, when I was you know uh, we had a, a story one time of a guy. A call came out in the middle of the night that uh, a woman had been killed. And so we were going out to cover the story and it ended up where the woman had just become engaged that night uh, and her fiance, uh, they were partying. He ha happened to work as a, as a um, landscaper and the call came across as someone was killed in a chipper. Mm -hmm. And that he had taken her and put her into the wood chipper because he found out she was having an affair that night that they got engaged. And I remember, and that's probably 30 years ago that I had that story, but it's always been there at the back of my mind, like, wow, that was completely out there. So, you know, I've got it sitting there waiting to figure out if there's something I want to do with that at some point. But, um, but it, it is, you know, sort of fun where you can look at things and you can look at life and then figure out how you can put your own little twist on it. Um, because life, I mean, good gracious, you know, I, I don't know about you guys, but I watch like those 24 hour crime shows and things like that, where you're watching, you know, which way it t goes and, and all those kinds of things. And, and I think that that's really critical to, to me as a writer, to be able to be as authentic as I can with it. Yeah, I, I'll add just quickly ahead. to what Sue said. It's so funny because it's so interesting to me that she mentioned the wood chipper because <laughs> I read a story too some years ago about a wood chipper and, um, and a, a, something that happened with the wood chipper. And we have, I live in a small town, Wendell. And so when we drive somewhere, we're driving down these roads sometimes that are just these little tiny roads and you see a house and then you don't see anything. Then you see a house, you don't see anything. And there's this one house that it's run down and there's a chipper out in the back and there's cows and there's wood everywhere. And some of the windows are boarded up and some are not. And I'm always, I actually have a piece started about how the person that lives in that house, that's a front for him. But what he really does, is he chops up, um, he's, he's for hire on the, um, on the dark web for people to bring bodies to him, to get rid of them for them, that if they've gotten rid of. So it's funny that you say that I have this <laughs> partial story written, um, using kind of that very same thing. So um, there will be a lot of wood chipper books coming out in the <laughs> <Yeah>. near future. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take a couple more from the Q&A just to make sure because we got quite a few building up here. Did anybody get um, inspired by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle? Mm -hmm. Which I believe is Sherlock Holmes. Was that Sherlock Holmes? Am I right? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, yeah, I love Sherlock Holmes. I read a lot of it when I was young, and I and I have my favorite Sherlock Holmes in, in terms of who does it on screen. You know, I my number one is um, now I'm blanking out on his name. Um, my number two is <laughs> Jeremy Britt uh, uh, on the BBC series, and then uh, you know I like some of the other ones. Okay, I like Benedict Cumberbatch. Okay, so I I love Sherlock Holmes. Um, another question. Um... Somebody's starting to write their own serial killer novel, since we got a couple of people that write that, Tammy and Sue. Um, mm -hmm. Where do you suggest somebody go to research um, serial killers? Sue, yeah. you want to? Yeah, I um, just because it, the thing, I love the internet now. I mean, you know, back when I was just getting started, you know, when we used typewriters and squat. Um, I mean, you, you really had to try to work to find all this information. Um, and now, you know, it's, it's like the internet is, it's a jumping off point. It's not the end all be all, but it's a jumping off point for you, you know, whether or not it's, um, you know, finding individuals that you might be able to reach out to, to have a cup of coffee and a conversation, you know, it's, and, and I don't know, I feel pretty comfortable with that and probably because I was used to cold calling as a journalist, but, but people can, they're flattered when you reach out to them and want to talk about what they do, you know, and if you're respectful with that, it, it's amazing how much information uh, you can get um, from doing it, doing it that way. Um, and then, like I said, I, I watch a lot of different kinds of crime shows from different countries. There's a very, very different, you know, sort of feel. And Tam, you probably get the same thing. You know, if it's a, a female cop up in Iceland, I'm like all in. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, you know, it there is a feel. It's it's like, you know, you talk about the place becoming a character in the book. You know, there's a pacing to it that's very different than ha from how we do it here in the US. So I really try to do a lot of that. And I, you know, I use it as an excuse to watch a lot of TV. The good news is, is that my wife likes it as well. So that helps. Um, but it's, it's, it's a start. Everybody's going to be a little different in your comfort level uh, in terms of talking to people and getting information. But, but I always say just that if you do go on the internet, just always remember that it's just the start. It's not the end from when you're you're writing and doing your characters. Yeah, I, I second that. I second all of that. And, and that's really, I, the dark web plays a big part in a lot of what I write. And I actually, the way that I began to learn what happens is I first started researching and there's uh, another browser called Tor, T-O-R, that is a browser for the dark web. But people think you can just go in there and use Tor and you can get into the dark web and you can get whatever you want. You cannot. I, and it, it, there are, it, it, there's whole protocols down there <laughs> that unless you're in there, you don't know. But what I did was I came across someone who um, was very open to letting me interview them. And I intend to interview them again with the understanding that I was never to mention a name, never to, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I, th I think as long as you honor what people are asking you to do and you show that you are true to what you say you will do and not do that, people are very willing to have conversations with you for you to research what you need. Um, I reached out to someone who handles cold cases at one point. Um, very open to talk to me about, you know, what you, what does happen, what doesn't happen, what can happen, what can't, you know, so research and, and don't be afraid to call people. Right. Can, can I add something also, Rita, if you Google serial killer, cause I'm kind of fascinated by serial killers too, but not like you guys, you're creepy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but if you Google serial killer and go to Wikipedia, there's at least four pages of real life serial killers and they're fascinating to read men and women of all ages, scary stuff. <laughs> and Facebook groups, ask to be a part of Facebook groups, but tell them why you're there. Don't just join a group like you're a survivor or um, you, ha you have to be true to them. You have to tell them, look, I'm doing research for a book. I would love to come in. I'd love to be able to. I, I wrote an autistic character 
and or a, a character with autism. And for that particular character, they allowed me in their Facebook group and I became great friends with many of them. So just you just have to think about where people are that you want to understand to be able to write. All excellent, excellent advice. I'm going to move on and I'm going to ask um, Cheryl and Stacy a question. Um, for some reason, it seems like, especially with crime, mystery, that people like series. And you two write series. Um, and I'm thinking that's probably a whole different ball game than writing a standalone. So Stacy, can you tell us a little bit about why you do state why you do series and how it's different from doing a standalone? Well, I like a story to 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 continue over m multiple books. Um, I take a single story arc and stretch it over two or three books. And that requires um, a lot of attention to, to detail. Um, if I have to change a fact in book three, that has a rippling effect sometimes all, all the way back, back, back to book one. So that's why I am a, a, a plotter. Um, and I have to write at least a year and a half in, 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 in advance of, of releases to give me time, 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 time to make change, 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 changes. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with Stacy. The, the arc is a little different. I, I don't think I went into the Charlie Mack series thinking about it as a series. I thought it was a standalone book. But once I knew it was a series, it opened up all these doors, these opportunities for storylines. And the, the plotting then becomes really necessary. The profiles become very necessary. The backstory on characters, uh, the, the focus on continuity. Um, but it does give you this freedom to build arcs, emotional arcs over, across a long period of time or um, uh, uh, across a journey or whatever it might be as a, as a device to organize it. And I guess the hardest part is really when I got, I think I got to book three and I realized I really need to set up a, like a Bible for this series so I can keep up with what I've said about the characters, what car they drive, who they're married to. But the, the, the freedom then is you have quite a bit of a, of a backstory that lets you write more storylines than I think you would otherwise. I'm, for instance, I'm uh, the next couple of books, I'm going to deal more with Charlie's partner, Mandy, because I think she has an inter interesting backstory that I, only I know. It's in the profile. It's never made it to the page, but I'm going to put it on the page. So the next few books will look at some of her history, her family history, and that kind of thing. And I have to ask, oh, sorry, go ahead, Stacey. Just want to add what I like most about writing in series, I think, is that my cast of characters become my friends because I'm, I'm writing with them for a year, year plus, and um, I live with them day and night. And when I close out my, my, my three, 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 three story arcs, arcs with, 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 with them, I actually weep because I miss them. So do you usually stick with three stories? Is that kind of your your thing or so far, yes. Um I I like to start a a a series with a uh, a three 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 book arc and then I'll I'll re revisit later. And I have to ask you, Cheryl, okay. I can barely remember my own characters' names and, oh. and they always say characters are are really big and I will remember Charlie Mack's name. Um, okay. And they say that's the, that's the way to, to get readers. I mean, like Sherlock Holmes, you know, Jack Reacher. And Charlie Mack is just a great name. Was it an accident or did you really think about that name? Well, when, again, when, back to Google. When you Google Charles and feminine derivatives, you get things like Cheryl and Charlie. So I, really, it's a play off my name, which is connected to Charles. And then my um, maiden name is McGarra. So it was an easy choice, Charlie Mack. Nice. Well, it's a great name. I, I just love the name. So <laughs> um, going back to some of the readers um, or the listeners' questions here. Um, has everyone's books always dealt with murder or do you have different types of, of mystery events? Anybody, I, I know Stacy, you do some different type of events. Do you want to talk a little bit about what you tackle? I tackle the, um, the drug, drug, drug world 
in uh, my man man Manhattan Sloan series, um, in my upcoming Falling Castle series, um, I I I tackle uh, uh, P PTSD from 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 rape. Um, so it just depends what what whatever strikes strikes me. I don't stick 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 to one 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 thing. And um, everybody else, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll um, because for me it's more I'm not it's not necessarily murder it's the it's the psyche so I'm all about the psychological thriller that's that's what I like so my Sandman happens to be getting into the head of a serial killer that's the whole idea behind Sandman but in Promises the idea there no one dies in Promises there's no murder. In promises, it's a very different type of psychological uh, thriller. Uh, so, um, for me, it's it's all about what's happening in their head, not necessarily murder. Okay, um, this is kind of taking us back to some previous questions. Um, one of the listeners wants to know um, how do you create space and be responsive to readers um, who want romance while being authentic to yourself and writing your thrillers? How do you try? Is there a technique you use to balance it? Um, you know, Cheryl says as long longer she goes on, she's stopped having sex with her characters. And um, what are you guys doing to kind of balance that? Cheryl? Yeah, I, you know, you do have to be conscious of what your reader's coming to you for. I, I'm such, I'm a purist around noir mysteries. And, you, you know, think of the 50 movies, the black and white ones when, the guy just looks up and says something like nice gams, that's that sex, or they have a cigarette after they met that sex, you know, so there's not a lot of sex in those classic kind of noir stories. Um, so I'm, I'm tending to put a little more just, it's more subtle in the subsequent books than it was in the first books where I put some really dynamite sex scenes, <laughs> but, you know, and I, I think I'm, you know, I think I want to be more true to myself around that and what I want to write. So, but I'm cognizant that I'm writing for Bywater Books, whose focus is on lesbian or WLW or sapphic literature. Um, I've got a few books uh, that don't don't have queer themes in it at all. You know, I'm I'm trying to write different things. I've written historical fiction, and I'm. I'm going to um, publish a book on historical fiction next year. So, you know, you you, you balance by, uh, between your needs as a writer and what you want to say and your stories you want to tell. But I do think uh, I, I'm always kind of cognizant of the of the reader. And I have one specific reader that I keep in mind because I'm always want to teach about diversity in my books. And I hope I'm doing it subtly more than didactically. So, but I have this white woman in Iowa who's unnamed and I always, when I'm writing, I'm always thinking, wonder if she'll get this, if she'll understand what I'm saying, because I want her to understand tolerance and diversity and the inclusion and the, the beauty of our world with all the peoples and all the contributions they make to this world. So That's great. Anybody else um, have a way that you guys are trying to balance that? Um, Stacy? Yeah, um, all of my series have both uh, action and and ro 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 romance. I like my stories to be equally driven by the action and 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 the characters. So that means um, adding in 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 relationships. Um, I like to use romance as scenes as 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 a breather between the action. So my characters go through a lot of. Uh, fast paced action and every time they 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 uh, get 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 through through th th through those high points they 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 have to de 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 decompress so i pe pepper in those those ten tender scenes to 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 let them uh to to let the pace slow 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 down a bit and that really goes to a question I was planning on asking you anyway, because your 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 pacing is quick. Um, I don't know. I'm going to date myself, but it kind of reminded me reading back in the day a Sydney Shelton book that every time you think everything can't go any faster, it goes a little faster. So um, I think you maybe answered that. But how do you slow down the pacing? Is it just with the relationship, or is there something else that you use to slow down the pacing? 
Well, primarily two, two, two things. Um, first, um, I don't get bogged down in too, 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 too much detail. I provide just enough to, to give, 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 give the reader an, an, an understand standing of, of, of the topic and the, and, 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 and the set, set setting. Then, um, I follow the, the action, uh, not necessarily the, the, the main, main, main characters. I push that, 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 that act, action along through a, a, a cast of strong secondary characters. I think by getting in, into their, their, their heads, um, I let the readers see why those sex secondary characters are, are doing those good and bad, bad things for, 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 for my main, main, main characters. And, 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 and that makes a, 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 a much richer story. Okay. I'm going to go back to the Q and a, um, um, one of the, the, the listeners said that their characters when they're writing seem to take on a life of their own. Does this happen to any of you? I'm sure all your characters do everything you want them to do all the time, right? <laughs> Cheryl, yeah, my kid, uh, uh, Tammy, go ahead. Right, Tammy. <laughs> I, just, I was just going to say, my I actually when I wrote Promises, I said I was going to try to write a romance. That I picked the characters, I had the plot lines, I had my arc written out. I was all good to go. It was going to be a romance. It was going to have some psychological pieces, but it was going to be basically a romance. My character said, no, not going to happen. You can sprinkle some romance in here because we are characters and, you know, we are people and people have feelings for other people. So you can have that, but you are in no way going to make this a romance. And so it's not at all, although there is some romance in there. And I, and I was going to say that I feel blessed when the characters talk to me. It doesn't happen all the time, but because when they do, it's so much easier. The dialogue is just there. They're telling you what they want to say, what they want to do. It's happened a few rare times and I'm just, you, then you're just a conduit. <laughs> you know, I love that when it happens. You know, that's, I was just, um, Cheryl was my mentor from the writing Academy. And so she had to read my, the first beginning of my book. Have to, I loved it. I loved <laughs> reading it. <laughs> but it was, it was pretty intense. And I remember telling her that I was working on point of view with it and that um, uh, I didn't know if the pacing was going in the, the speed that I needed it to, you know, stop for a little dip in the romance water and, you know, move on. Um, and I was laughing because I told her that I was, you know, 30,000 words in and I was at day two, you know, so I was having so much fun with the characters and the detail and everything that was going on that I was like, I, you know, those characters were very real and very much there and, you know, and they stopped me, you know, from, from being able to move, you know, I'm like, Stacey, you, you know, you talk about moving quickly Mine was the opposite in moving slowly um, in trying to, to, you know, get this thing moving. But I, I just enjoyed the characters so much that I was just like, oh, my God. And then she did this and all oh, this is so much fun and then didn't realize that I was at day two. <laughs> That's a little too slow. What about you, Stacey? Um, yeah, when I start a a series, I usually have the the two main characters in mind. And then uh, uh, as as I'm developing the, the out, 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 out outlines, then those sex, sex secondary characters appear. And it's those characters that help me really to build build my my mains that that give them that 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 richer richer back 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 background of fam fam family and work and education so um they they tend to talk to me during the 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 the, the planning stay stages uh let's see when you use real people or as secondary or even tertiary characters how do you do it so that you're, there aren't any legal issues um if you have 
because I think it's, it's probably a reaction to pulling things from the headlines. If you use people that are real, do you worry about legal um, issues? Um, mm. yeah. Do you guys ever use people that are real? I, I was considering one of the next Charlie Mack uh, stories to riff off of Jimmy Hoffa, but I'm kind of scared to do that because I don't want to piss off any Teamsters. <laughs> 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 so I, I, I had the conversation with them. I'm going like, uh, so if I do Jimmy Hoffa, that means I have to keep some authentic, factual stuff in here. And who might get pissed off of that with that? And, you know, so your publisher should be the person asking you those questions. Um, this is what's your source material? Do you have some backing? What's your secondary source material? So you have to you have to be careful when you're using real people's names and real towns and all that stuff because there are people. Some people will get offended, and sometimes you will get some legal action against you. Yeah, I am. Um, I actually in promises the when I started, I had in mind my best friend from when I was young, who I was in love with, who I didn't even know back then. We were just kids. Um, but she, the, the actual, the house in the Book of Promises um, is actually the house I grew up in. If you look at the living room, how the living room is described, that's my living room. And then we had a house between us and then she lived one house over. And we used to talk about how uh, we wished we could make the house in between us disappear so that there was nothing between us. And and when I started, I said I was going to write this nice romance, right? So I was, my thought was, for all it's worth, that I would explore what it would have been like had things, she's very straight, very um, cis, but, you know, just uh, still very good friends. But um, so I thought, well, what if things had gone differently, what would that have looked like? So I started out thinking about a real person, uh, but in the end, it took a very dark and very different turn. So nobody think that my that my friend was, was a, a, a sociopath, she really wasn't. Um, but I, I still had to be really careful because then she was in my head a lot when I was writing. And I used to think, okay, I have to be really careful to not make this too much like she is because I don't want to run into any of those kinds of problems. But I think you have to be very, very careful and really think about that very carefully when you're when you're using real people to um, to to write your characters. We have another question from um, the listeners here. This is a great question. Um, are there certain tropes, topics, character types that you avoid? Um, is there anything that's off limits in this group? Cheryl. We'll start with that. I'm never going to write about a uh, missing child. I mean, it's it's so ubiquitous in mystery and crime fiction. I know it happens. I just don't want to write it because, uh, one, it hurts me, you know, But and I, I just, I'm not going there ever. <laughs> I won't write a character who cheats. You can walk right up to the line, but never, ever cross it. Um, and I will never write a book where um, uh, a pet is hurt. So, love dogs. Dogs and cats. I, I don't have a line. I was going to say, I didn't think <laughs> Tammy and Sue might not have a line, but I was hoping maybe. <laughs> nope, okay. <laughs> and Sue's being quiet, so I don't think she has a line either. I don't think so. Uh, you, you dogs, dogs. <laughs> dogs and cheating, but then everything else is open. <laughs> okay. All right. I killed a dog. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that might stop me. That that would probably stop me for a bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's see. Um, one of the things um here people are asking um Stacy, they know that you have audiobooks out. Um, Tammy and Cheryl, are you guys thinking about doing audiobooks? And Sue, I know you've still got to get published, so this mm -hmm. is really for Cheryl and Tammy yet. Mm -hmm. Any audiobooks in your future? Yeah, I just um, got a contract for audiobooks for all six Charlies. Um, all right. I haven't signed it yet, but I've got the deal. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Tammy. And I would like to. I really haven't. I really haven't explored that yet, but it is something I do want to explore. I really like what you say about your characters, and I think that's really what makes a base for a series. Do you agree? 
I, I think what they, they're saying is, you know, is your character what drives a series is what I think the question is. Okay. Um, yeah. Like I said, um, all of my books, they are equally driven by, 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 by the story and the, and, and, and the characters. Um, my mains, um, I always try make them lovable characters who are flawed, sometimes deeply flawed. And over the course of those uh, three, three, three story arcs, they, they, they trans transform addressing those, those deep flaws. So you'll, um, the, the mains at the, at the, at the beginning of the series are not the same at the end. They, they have trans, trans, tr transformed from, from borderline hero to someone that, that, that you really want, 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 want to root, root, root for. Okay. Um, question for you guys. There's, there's always one story that you wish you would have wrote. And I know for me, it's Gone Girl. Just love Gone Girl and this and thing. I wish I would have had the creativity to write that. Is there anything that you guys would just have loved to have written? Sue. Oh, goodness. You know, I, I uh, probably Bosch. Um, I just love his character. He just, he is his own dude. And, you know, he's gone down this road in life and he's not worrying too much about what anybody else thinks and except for his daughter i just love that that's that piece for him that that is you know it's a little flawed but he's he's trying real hard but i would say the bosch books i just love the character tammy what about you um i think maybe dexter i don't know if you guys ah. have heard <laughs> yeah I, I that would have been i would have that would have been pretty cool there's a theme here i'm here i'm feeling here <laughs> stacy I would have liked to have gotten into Earl Stan, 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 Stanley Gard, 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 Gardner's head, and make Del, Della, Della Street a a more 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 prominent character. Character. I love that idea. I yeah. love that. I love that idea. Yeah. For me, it would be um, there's a, there's a series of books called the Blanche books by a, a author named Barbara Neely. Um, it's an amateur detective who is a maid, a black maid, and she solves problems in the households she works in. It's a lovely, lovely series. Um, she's got four books in that series and I think they're wonderful. And I would also add, um, I love Sue Grafton's Kinsey Milhone character. And I, sometimes I think about the, you know, she has these little idiosyncrasies that are so wonderful. She surrounds herself with this kind of adopted family. So I think her secondary characters are really, really interesting. Uh, she uh, lives in a fictional town. I think it's called Santa Clarita. I think that's fictional in California. I no, admire no. Grafton series. I used to live, 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 live there. It's real. So it's a real place. Okay. Interesting. Magic Mountain is there. Ah. Here's another question from the readers um, or the listeners. Sorry. Um, does a thriller have to come out of the gate fast um, or can you peel away the story or do you want to explode right into the action? Um, Stacy, since you're, you're the pacer, um, what do you think about that? Amy. Well, you always have to start off with something, something dramatic or in, 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 in impactful something that that sets sets the stage mine always start with a with a pro pro prologue that that sets the stage for 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 the character and then my chapter ones sets 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 set the stage for 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 the main action action plot what 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 crimes happen uh, well, I agree with Stacy. There always has to be something uh, that's happening that's going to give you a tiny clue about what's going to happen. Uh, the, when the beach was its own character, the, the book starts with a hurricane that's happened off the coast that has spawned tornadoes on the beach and has ripped houses apart. And so my main character is part of an EMS team that is there um, just figuring out whether people are dead or alive and tagging them and that's how they find the body. Um, so I think that you have to have something impactful at the beginning, but I don't think it has to be 
you know, I don't, I don't think there has to be like a murder at the beginning right away or something. I guess it depends on what you're writing too. I mean, sure. might disagree with that. I mean, or you might have to have something yeah, to solve. Yeah. No, I don't, beginning. I don't disagree with that. I, I, I think only one book in the Charlie series, I think of as a thriller. Um, and that would be the second book where I talk about, a. um, a domestic terrorist situation around the auto show in Detroit. And, um, but I tend to always start with, uh, I, I tend to always start with uh, a, a little bit of the protagonist's life or something that reveals something about the protagonist. I, 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 I prefer that, I don't know. Um, my editors for the book one, which is a good book, my editor made me put some action first. She, she made me do a prologue and it turned out to be a better book for it, you know? But that, that was not my instinct. My instinct was to reveal a little bit about Charlie, see her in some kind of a, either a domestic setting or in her work as a, a, a PI that uh, reveals something about her personality, her quirkiness, uh, you know, how, the way she thinks about life. And I, I think for me, it was, I'm gonna come out smack you upside the face. Yeah. You know, it's, that's, that's my, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's memorable and, and it gives the person who's reading the opportunity to decide whether or not they want to continue. You know, it, it, it's sort of like, this is how we're going and you can come along for the ride with me if you want, but if you don't, and if this is too much, that's okay as well but you'll know exactly what's going to be happening, you know, throughout the rest of the book. So, uh, yeah, yeah. It's going to be a little tough at the beginning. Fun. Okay. It looks like we're heading to the top of the hour. I'm sorry. I couldn't get to everyone's question and answer, but, um, I would like to end with a final question. Um, we've, it seems like we've got a bunch of aspiring writers probably watching this. So I'd like, um, your best piece of advice. Um, I'll stay with you, Stacey. What's the best piece of advice for somebody who wants to write in this genre? I think I touched it. It's um, start by creating lovable heroes who are flawed. Um, detective fictions um, often have uh, gritty, gr gritty situations, and your main characters and 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 their sidekicks have to be more real, 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 realistic. And that comes if if they're Im, 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 imper, per, 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 perfect, um, have them making amends or see, seeking vengeance. Uh, make them uh, self, self, selfless to, 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 to the point of 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 being reckless. the The idea is 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 to build em empathy through through a complexity you 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 do that and and it's 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 a golden story great sue what about you um the best piece of advice i got was that make sure that your killer has some kind of a redeeming value you know that it, that you know cheryl knows exactly what i'm talking about it's like you can make them really really out there on the edge but but there has to be something that makes them real and a person and someone that you can relate to. So, you know, it's like, yeah, they might be bad, but there's something else to the individual. So uh, that's been fun to try to go back and, and take care of that. It's a great advice. Tammy. Uh, my, my biggest piece of advice is to read in the genre, but read like a writer. So instead of just reading for pleasure and just taking it all in and, and just for the enjoyment is to dissect it, analyze it. What are the writers doing that grabs your attention? When are you engrossed in what you're reading and what's happening right then? How is it paced? How do you, how does that reader deal with slowing things down? When you write a thriller or you write something that's fast action, like Stacy said earlier, you have to have moments where you slow things down and let your reader breathe. Where does that happen in, in your genre and the books that you like? How can you mimic that in your own way in your own books? So that would, that would be my piece of advice is to, to read like a writer and not like a reader. And Cheryl. 
Um, my advice I've heard and I give to people now is to have cultural humility when you're writing about people who are not like you, um, so that you come to them with a lot of curiosity. Uh, your prejudgment, I think, falls away when you think about the person you're writing with, uh, with, with this kind of honest humility about their lives, because you can't be stereotypical and tropey and prejudiced if you're looking at some, someone with amazement. That was great. I've really enjoyed this. I thank everybody for being here. The panelists, I had a great time. This was a, like hanging right. out and having a drink I with love everybody. You, girl. So, I love lots you. of fun. So, <laughs> thank you, everybody, for coming, and we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you.